Our Across the Aisle segment tonight, riots broke out in St. Louis after the acquittal of police officer Jason Stockley for his role in the shooting of a black man following a police chase. Of course, these riots shouldn't surprise anyone because just last week, we covered the story of a group of black clergy in St. Louis condoning violence if Officer Stockley was acquitted. So put aside the Black Lives Matter movement's troubling use of political violence, and that's not a small thing, but they aren't even getting the facts of this case right. First, watch what happened. The events surrounding the killing of 24-year-old Anthony Lamar Smith began in the parking lot of a fast food restaurant on December 20, 2011. Officer Jason Stockley and his partner tried to corner Smith with their police SUV after seeing what appeared to be a drug transaction. Stockley testified he believed he saw a gun. The officer fired seven shots as Smith backed into the police vehicle and drove away. Get him. A two-minute chase ensued. Shot fired. Police dash cam video captures Stockley saying that he wanted to kill the suspect while in pursuit. As Smith's car slowed, Stockley told his partner to crash into the car. Stockley emerged from the SUV and fired five shots into the suspect's car, killing Smith. Stockley's defense attorney said he fired only when Smith refused commands to put up his hands instead reaching along the seat where a gun was found. Prosecutors said Stockley planted a revolver in Smith's car. With me now, Democratic strategist Joel Payne. Joel, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. All right, Joel, this is not a good topic. This is not a happy topic. This is a tragic topic. Somebody lost their lives. Somebody else's life uh, was ruined as a result of this. But when I look at these riots in St. Louis, and I hope you agree with me on this, the first thing that comes to mind is that the way that you handle injustice in our criminal justice system is not to not to respond with violence to violence. And that's what these people are doing. And I think it discredits their point. Well, a couple things. First, um, you know, I think we have to acknowledge that most of the protesters are not violent. Most of the protesters are exercising their constitutional right to express their opinion about what happened and they're doing so in a peaceful and responsible way. There are people in that group that are abusing that privilege and, and of course uh, law enforcement should seek those folks out and should stop them. But let's draw back and look at the bigger picture here. There are so many, let's face it, African Americans who do not feel protected by police. Does that mean that every a uh, police officer, every person that has taken the oath of a police officer is wrong? No. There are so many wonderful police officers. I know many of them myself. But this is about a longer burn. This is a long, slow burn of concern in the African American community about whether police are actually on their side. Um, right. And so I and think I, that's, that's a what conversation you're seeing. You're that we, seeing it's a conversation that, that we need to over. have. Yeah. It's a conversation we need to have because that that fear is very real, whether it's based off of fact or whether it's not based off of fact, that's almost irrelevant because what people are feeling, the people who are marching in the streets, that's very real and we need to acknowledge that. But this is where it gets political. And I want to talk about two things here. I want to talk about the political narrative that surrounds this and I want to talk th about the facts of this case because I feel that it is a combination of the two that cause riots, cause unrest and cause fear like this. Because when you have Democratic leaders, when you have the group of black preachers from St. Louis saying that if the verdict of this case is anything other than guilty to expect riots, to expect violence, that the blood will be on the hands of the judge, that political narrative strikes fear in people's hearts. That political narrative, not based off of fact, not based off of the case, that causes people to fear that they are the target of police officers. And that's not fair to the people who truly are not targets. I think what the folks who are protesting in the street would say is you're, you're you're totally right in, in the sense that we don't need to, you know, one, one uh, bad act does not beget another bad act, and we, and we shouldn't be promoting that. But think about what African Americans in St. Louis, going back to Michael Brown and this case and other cases, St. Louis area police are notorious for this. Think about what their feelings are when they get stopped by a police officer and when they wonder, Hmm, is this, is this a routine stop? Is this a stop where I'm going to be treated fairly or is this a stop where my life is at but risk? But that's, that's not there what happened at all with this case. There are a lot of African Americans in this country that feel that way. 
that's not what happened Maybe at all with this case. I mean, did you see the, did you see case, the video? But you have to, but you did have you see to, the you video? He ran this, away from have police to, officers at 90 miles an hour. They told him to stop. He didn't. Liz, he rammed into their car. The they told haul. him to raise his hands. He didn't. He reached for a gun. I mean, if you're talking about feelings here, why aren't to, we talking about the feelings of police officers who are sincerely worried that their lives are in risk when they're trying to conduct routine stops or when they're trying to, to view, stop to, a drug transaction? To view this in the, in the lens of one concentrated case with one concentrated set of facts really does a disservice to the entire experience that African Americans have been feeling really for a long time. It's really been hyper, um, you, know, you know, I think TV and I think reporters and I think media have covered it over the last 25 or so years, but it's been for a long time and it is distrust in law enforcement. And it's because so many of these experiences have been negative. Have some of them been justified? I'm sure, I'm sure if you go back and maybe this case, maybe there are elements here where it's justified, but you have to look at what is the longer, you know, what, what, are, what are people but feeling why are we about the relationship the two with the police then? officers? Why are we conflating the two issues? And I'm not you denying, I'm not denying that there's African been discrimination American against African-American citizens not by the conflate. police in history. I'm not denying that at all. That is something that we need to talk about, especially when it's uh, non-lethal use of force against black people. That is a higher statistic than against white people. That's not okay, and we need to have that conversation. But we can't conflate the two things. We can't conflate uh, you know, a, a situation, a case like this, where the judge found it to be justified. I mean, if you read the 30-page ruling, there's almost no question that it was justified that Anthony Lamar Mar Smith, it's tragic that he died, but he did the wrong thing and the police acted according to their procedures for the most part. I mean, there's no question that that was justified. And then you have verbal, you have verbal rhetoric coming from these preachers saying, you know, oh, if he's found, if he's found anything other than guilty, then violence is going to come. It smears the two things. I don't think that does a service to anyone. Liz, if you fear for your life when the police pull you over, there is no, there, you don't care about conflation of the issue. That's what the bigger point is here that I think everyone, no matter what color, creed, background they come from, has to understand. There's a longer epidemic here, and I, and I appreciate you acknowledging off the top that there's a larger issue that we have to address. And I really think that we have to get at that root issue of where does the distrust start? What, the, what can the police do to, to root out the distrust? And what can the community do can, to, to also mitigate that distrust as well? I think there's a larger issue here. I think you're going to continue to see things like this happen because these are symptoms of a larger problem. You're right. There are probably facts in this case that would support the officer's claims. But there are so many other cases where you know, suspects have not gotten a, 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 a fair uh, hearing. They have not gotten a fair bit of treatment from police. And I think that's where you see a lot of the concern come from. Right. Well, the, what I'm saying is that fear, that fear wouldn't be as widespread as it is if we didn't conflate cases where it's justified like this one with cases where it's not justified. People wouldn't feel that fear of being pulled over for, you know, a routine traffic stop and they'd fear for their lives. That wouldn't be the case if Democrats weren't constantly ginning up this fear by pretending that that is really the case. That's dangerous. And I think if we're going to have that conversation, figure out out how to solve this problem, both from the police perspective and from the community perspective. If we're going to really have that problem, we have to look at the facts and not just listen to political narratives. Joel, thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate you talking about this.